Okay, so we're going to look at a function which doesn't have a minimum, and I think it's quite surprising this particular example doesn't have a minimum. But before we come to this particular function, we'll just look at some simpler examples of functions which do and don't have a minimum. So for example, if our function was just f of x is x squared, we know what the graph of this function looks like for all real values of x, and you can see this does have a minimum of zero when x is zero. And this, of course, doesn't have a maximum. It just keeps on going bigger and bigger. But if we had negative x squared, we'd have the reverse of this. We would have a maximum, but this function wouldn't have a minimum because the minimum, we could just keep going smaller and smaller. There is no minimum value. And if we go on to f of x is x cubed, this is an example of a function which actually doesn't have a minimum or a maximum. It just keeps getting bigger. It keeps getting smaller. So there is no minimum. There is no maximum here. And finally, if we look at this example, we've got a quartic, which if we were to plot this and you could, using some calculus, work out where the minima and maxima are of this function, we would actually get that this function does have a minimum, which it achieves. So the minimum value is negative 9, and it has this when x is 1 and also when x is 3. So this function does have a minimum. And you can see there's a bit of a pattern here that where we've got the even powers, it is possible to have a minimum. But whenever we've got an odd power, like x cubed or x to the 5, if the largest power of our polynomial is odd, this function's not going to have a minimum or a maximum, whereas if it's even, then we could have a minimum or we could have a maximum. You have exactly one, so you could have the scenario where it's got a minimum or you could have the scenario where it's got a maximum if you've got an even degree polynomial. And if we look at some non-polynomial examples, we get some even more interesting behaviour. So, for example, if we've got the function is 1 over x squared, where x isn't equal to 0, then we know that the graph looks like this, and it asymptotes off towards 0 as x goes to positive or negative infinity. So there is no minimum here, but the smallest value that this can be equal to doesn't exist, because it can't actually be equal to 0, but it can get closer and closer to 0. So for this one, we can say that there's no minimum, but we could say that this has something called an infimum. So the infimum we would say here is equal to zero, because this we think of this as being the biggest possible lower bound. So you could take a lower bound, for example, of negative one or negative a half, but if you go up to zero, this is the biggest possible lower bound, so our function is always greater than that. So this does have this idea of a biggest lower bound, the infimum. And similarly, if our function was the arctan function, because we're going into a transcendental function here, we can get some really interesting structure that we didn't see with the polynomials, that our arctan function looks like this, and actually doesn't have a maximum, and it doesn't have a minimum, but it does have an infimum. So here the infimum would be negative pi over 2. This is our biggest possible lower bound, but the graph never actually achieves negative pi over 2. There's no value of x we can put in and get out negative pi over 2. And similarly, we have what we call a supremum of pi over 2. So this is our smallest upper bound possible, but then there's never any value of x where this function is actually equal to pi over 2 as its output. So here, there's no minimum, there's no maximum, but there is an infimum, there is a supremum, which are both finite. And we can get the same sort of thing for a polynomial by messing with this by restricting the domain. So instead of just having all possible real values of x, if we now say x has to be strictly between 0 and 1, you can see that here we do actually have there's an infimum at 0, so the infimum is just 0, but there's no value of x we can put in to get this equal to 0, but we can get arbitrarily close to 0. And similarly, we'd have a supremum of 1, but there's no value of x we can put in and actually get 1 out. We can just get closer and closer to this. So what have we learned here? Well, if we're working with polynomials, it seems quite nice and straightforward, but when we go into non-polynomial examples of functions, we can get this idea of having a supremum, having an infimum, but not having a corresponding minimum or a maximum. But if we work with a polynomial, then it's quite nice and straightforward. We either have its odd degree, in which case there's no minimum, there's no maximum, but you could say the supremum would be infinity and the infimum would be negative infinity. Or if we're in the case where we've got an even degree polynomial, it could have a minimum, and the minimum would also be the infimum. So like with y equals x squared, for example, the minimum and the infimum, the biggest possible lower bound, would just be zero. Whereas with y equals negative x squared, you could have a maximum, and that's the same as the supremum, but there's no minimum in that case.
It turns out we can actually break this by considering a two-variable polynomial function. So we know with a one-variable polynomial function, it's not possible to have this behaviour of having no minimum, but there is an infimum. So like with 1 over x squared, we have this infimum of 0, but we never quite reach this, having an asymptote kind of structure. And similarly with arctan, we have negative pi over 2, which we never quite reach. But it's not possible to do this with a polynomial in one variable without restricting the domain. But for example, with this function here, you can see, first of all, that this function isn't going to have a maximum. So you could just take, say, y is 0, and then this would just become 1 plus x squared, which, you know, we can make this as big as we like just by choosing a really big value of x. And then let's think about what happens with our minimum of this function, or an infimum. So you can see the function is the sum of two different things squared. So clearly it's going to be greater than or equal to 0, because we're just squaring a real number there. But could we actually make this equal to 0? So if we had fxy equal to 0, this would tell us then that each of these two terms would have to be 0, because this thing is greater than or equal to 0, and so is this other term, the x squared. So you'd need, first of all, 1 minus xy equals 0, and you would also need x equals 0. And then, of course, if we make x equal to 0, then this makes our other equation 1 minus 0 equals 0, which is impossible. So if you make one of the terms 0, it forces the other one not to be 0. So unfortunately, this one doesn't actually have a minimum. But are we sure then that 0 is our infimum? Is there not some upper bound we could choose that's bigger than 0? So for this function, let's think about this really carefully. We could substitute in, we could actually take y equals 1 over x minus 1 and substitute this in. So then we get f of xy is 1 minus x times 1 over x minus 1, all squared plus x squared. And then expanding within this bracket, we get 1 minus 1 and then minus x times 1. So we literally just get x squared plus another x squared, which is 2x squared. So choosing this specific value of y to depend on x, you can see we could pick now a really small value of x closer and closer to 0, and we could make our function f of xy closer and closer to 0. But could we just substitute in x is 0 then if our function is this? Well, remember this only works because y equals 1 over x minus 1, so we couldn't actually take x equals 0. We'd be in a bit of a problem with x is 0 and maybe y is infinity. So it turns out we can get closer and closer by choosing this value of y and just choosing x small but not quite equal to 0. We can get as close to 0 as we like, so this function can't actually be equal to 0, so there's no minimum but there is an infimum, and the infimum, our greatest lower bound here, is just equal to zero, because we can get closer and closer to this. Which I think is really surprising, because this is a polynomial function, albeit with two variables. So our seemingly nice polynomial function has an infimum of zero, but it doesn't have a minimum, so it seems to have this same sort of property that for one variable functions is reserved only for non-polynomial functions, unless we restrict the domain. So we'll understand what's going on here by looking at a few more examples. All of these functions are, again, just for all real values of x and y. So for our first function, we can see that if we want this to be equal to 0, we would need y would need to be equal to 1 over x squared, and here we'd also need y would need to be equal to 0 in order for the y squared term to be 0. So obviously this is going to be greater than or equal to 0 because it's the sum of two things squared, but it's not actually going to be possible to make it equal to 0 just like before because we can't have both y equals 1 over x squared and y equals 0. There's no value of x that would make this work. So this one has no minimum again and the infimum is going to be equal to zero. And we can think about this as this kind of works because if we think about y equals one over x squared and y equals zero, think about these actually perhaps on a graph, we know that y equals one over x squared and y equals zero. While they don't overlap, there's no minimum, they, they can get closer and closer to each other so we can, we do get this infimum property of having zero. I think this becomes a bit clearer if we look at a non-example for our second one. So here, if we wanted to make this equal to zero, we would set the first one, y minus x squared minus one is zero, and y is x squared plus one. And the second one, this is going to be zero when y is negative x squared minus one. So if we drew both of these on a graph, then 
we could choose different values of x, but we'd have y equals x squared plus 1 would be this, and y equals negative x squared minus 1 would be this curve here. And you can see these two don't overlap, but also they don't get anywhere near each other. There isn't this asymptote in our kind of zero set here. So here, if we wanted both of these to be equal to zero, there's no value of x that we could actually choose that would make this work. However, if we were to expand all of the brackets here, this function, if we expand everything and simplify, we're going to get 2x to the 4 plus 4x squared plus 2y squared plus 2. And you can see here that we've got lots of even powers. So all of this is going to be greater than or equal to zero. But you can see here, just choosing x and y both equal to zero, we can make our function equal to two. And we can't possibly make it any smaller than this. So this function has a minimum which is equal to two. I'll just write the minimum equals two and also the infimum equals two. So this didn't really work like our first example or the one from earlier because these two sets where each side of the each of these squared terms is zero, each of these don't get anywhere near each other, and they also don't overlap. So if we have a look at this third example to really consolidate what we've learned here. For this third example, we would need for the first squared term to be equal to zero, we would need, let's rewrite this as x squared minus y squared needs to be equal to one. And for the second one, we just need y to be equal to x. So we can understand this one a bit more geometrically than before. So this is actually the equation of a hyperbola, first of all. And this hyperbola has got an asymptote at the line y equals x, and it's also got an asymptote at the line y equals negative x. So our hyperbola gets closer and closer to y equals x or y equals negative x as x and y get closer to plus or minus infinity. But these two these two zero sets never actually intersect. So it's not possible to have y equals x and x squared minus y squared equals one. So you just end up with zero equals one on the left-hand side. However, we could take, for example, we could take y equals the square root of x squared minus one. And as x and y grow to infinity, this would actually converge, our y minus x would indeed converge to zero, which you could check using some calculus if you're interested. So we can get closer and closer to zero by choosing y as root x squared minus one, then this would make our y minus x squared term approach zero as x and y get bigger and bigger. And of course, with y equals root x squared minus one, then this term would just be zero. So this does indeed have, it's got an infimum of zero, but it's got no minimum. And again, it's this idea of our zero sets for each of these squared terms get closer and closer to each other, but don't actually intersect or overlap. And for our original example here, in order for this to be zero, you can see we need one minus x y equals zero, or y equals one over x. And for this term to be equal to zero, we need x equal to zero. So here, because these two solution sets, they can get closer and closer to each other. So we could take x closer and closer to zero, but we can never have x equals zero and y equals one over x. So because these two zero sets can get closer to each other, we have this property of not having a minimum, but having an infimum, just like we saw with examples one and three here as well.